All right, let's talk about eating disorders. Eating is fun, isn't it? Yep. But when does it become disorders? Um, there's two different main eating disorders, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Um, they're pretty much the same thing, but their main distinction is based off of their body weight. Okay. So, um, so let's talk about anorexia nervosa first. Okay. Um, for that disorder, your body weight has to be under 85% of ideal body weight or your BMI would be under 17.5 and it must not be due to a medical condition and you have to be doing behavior in order to maintain a certain body weight or look. And those behaviors are such as? Um, there's a restricting type which is um, just not eating in general or eating very little and mm -hmm. um, exercising a lot or there's um, a purging type 2 which would be like vomiting, using diuretics, using enemas. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So people get into some behaviors which lead to these symptoms mm -hmm. and that's when we make those diagnoses of anorexia. Okay. And in women, what other con symptoms they might have? Um, with anorexia, it's comorbid with depression, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, anxiety, body dysmorphic disorder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. that? Absolutely. Is it more common in men or women? It's 90% 90, 90 of all people with anorexia have, are, ma or are females, sure. but males also have it, mainly, um, the males that typically have it, um, it's a lot more common in the homosexuals and um, so people who do certain sports like wrestling. Um, I know pole vaulting, you have to maintain a certain weight for that. Mm -hmm. So they may have that behavior too. Okay. And then women also can have amenorrhea mm -hmm. uh, as, as one of the presenting symptoms as well. You know? uh, so having said that, it's a very devastating condition and can be very difficult and is it more common in eastern cultures or western culture? Um, western. Western culture, yeah. it's very very common because we kind of tend to look at body physique and how we should we look and we make a big deal about that mm -hmm. you know? and so people tend to be that model and that extreme thinness is seen as a good thing. Yeah. You know? Okay. So having said that, um, uh, let's kind of shift gears and, and maybe have a minute or two about some of the things uh, about uh, bulimia nervosa. Mm -hmm. What is bulimia nervosa? Um, bulimia nervosa is um, at least twice a week for three months. You have to be eating more than what would be considered um, normal in one sitting and having some form of purging behavior that we talked about before. And Unlike anorexia nervosa, so these individuals are usually slightly overweight. Okay. Okay. In this chapter, did we talk about obesity at all or no? Yes. Okay. All right. So what is obesity? People, everybody's talking about obesity anymore. <laughs> obesity is defined as having a body weight greater than 20% of ideal or a BMI over 30. Okay. Okay. All right. And why is obesity such a big issue these days? Um, what was it, 55? 55% 55 yeah. of all Americans right now are obese, and I think it's one third of children are obese at this point. And we're now seeing a lot of disorders in children that we never saw before, such as type two diabetes. It used to be called adult onset diabetes, but now we can't even call it that because so many children are getting it. Yes, and it's very important. We were on vacations, and uh, I, I, I observed a family. Uh, some, sometimes it's because we just don't know what we are eating and how we are eating that. And we were sitting with a family, actually observing a family, where the mom was asking a young girl to drink pop. And, and that young girl did not want to drink that pop. And she kept on saying, for mom's sake, have some. <laughs> it was very interesting to observe the lack of knowledge uh, which was then creating that young girl who actually was not interested in drinking, which is not common. 
so our goal here is really kind of help us become more knowledgeable and understanding what and how these things happen so that we can become empowered with knowledge and make better choices. Okay? So, um, so to further this thing, oftentimes when we have a condition, the next question is, what do we do with it? And we'll have Peter uh, today talk about obesity in general. And that obesity topic is so very common. Uh, we see in our practice people coming in with, with a lot of psychiatric symptoms due to obesity or obesity being caused by their psychiatric symptoms. And, and thus we have to break this cycle uh, of, of shame and guilt to an awareness, knowledge, which, which works in an everyday life. Um, and so those tools are so very critical. We'll be having um, uh, Peter who has prepared some information for an everyday use uh, about obesity, some facts about that, and also what we really can do in an everyday life. And, and many of those things, if you find it hard to uh, uh, know or practice or find it from your everyday uh, you know, clinical setting, uh, you're welcome to come to Seclair and we have designed uh, special programmings for those who may be struggling with emotional difficulties related to eating disorders and or eating disorders related to their emotional difficulties. Uh, so thank you. Eating disorders is our subject for the day. Um, this is a teaching topic that we think is important because of the uh, incidence of obesity in this country and also among our patients. Um, as you can see from this first uh, PowerPoint, 55% of the U.S. population is now considered to be obese. And um, as uh, we heard earlier, uh, obesity is a BMI uh, of 30 or an excess of 20% or more above ideal body weight. Uh, we'll get into ideal body weight and BMI in a few minutes. Anorexia nervosa uh, for which, which has a rather high mortality rate, but is less than about 2% of the U.S. population. Um, that's uh, essentially a condition where the patient has 85% uh, of his or her ideal body weight. And bulimia, uh, the mortality related to bulimia is unknown. Uh, but it involves binge eating and, in most cases, normal weight. Ideal body weight. There are two simple ways to compute it, and they both can be done in our heads, whereas BMI is a bit more complicated, as you'll see in a minute. For men, 106 plus 6, what does that mean? 106 pounds for the first 5 feet, and then 6 pounds for every inch above that. So a man uh, five feet, seven inches tall, I happen to be five, seven. My ideal body weight is 106 pounds plus seven times six, which is 148 pounds. My actual body weight is 146, measured a couple days ago at Westmoreland Hospital. For women, it's similar, the calculation, but the numbers are different. It's 105 pounds for the first five feet and five pounds for each inch above that. So a woman 5'3 would have an ideal body weight of 105 plus 15 or 120 pounds. Now those are easy calculations that we can do in our head. Um, let's move on to the next one. Body mass index is uh, more commonly used uh, for uh, calculating obesity, but it's harder to calculate because it's weight in kilograms. Um, my weight is 68 uh, kilograms, uh, divided by height in meters squared. Now, the average person, even some exceptional ones, don't know their height and they're in meters and therefore can't square it. Uh, for a man 5 feet 7 and 148, this is the same individual we looked at in the preceding uh, view graph, 67 inches is 1.7 meters, 
and 148 pounds is 67.3, I, I said 68 a minute ago, I should have said 67.3 kilograms. 67.3 kilograms divided by 1.7 meters squared is a BMI, body mass index, of 23.3. Let's move on to the next one. BMI ranges, underweight is below 18.5. Five. Normal is 18.5 to 24.9, and overweight is 25 basically to 30. Obesity category 1 is 30 to 35, and obesity category 2 is 35 to 39.9. And extreme or morbid obesity is 40 or more. Now, I did a little bit of arithmetic in an attempt to connect um, the uh, ideal body weight computation and uh, BMI of 30. And the answer is that if you take your ideal body weight and add 42 percent to it, that equates to a BMI of 30. In the case of the patient who has an ideal body weight of 148, uh, if he, that same person, uh, has a BMI of 42%, a weight 42% higher than that, he will have a BMI of 30. So that's the simple way to compute uh, BMI related to ideal body weight. Since you can do ideal body weight in your head, it's possible actually to get close to the BMI by just adding 42% of the ideal body weight. Um, the risks of obesity are multiple. Uh, some of the most important are hypertension, which means high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, gallbladder disease, kidney stones, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, and these now become a little bit less common. Dementia, select cancers, in the case of women, menstrual irregularities, amenorrhea, and polycystic ovary syndrome. So there are, as you can see from this impressive list, lots of reasons not to be overweight and even more reasons not to be obese. Weight loss strategy. This is from a, a set of federal guidelines on this subject. The essence of it is really very simple. Doing it is not so simple. The essence of it is to take in fewer calories per day then you burn. And we burn calories for two reasons, what's called resting metabolism and then metabolic effort other than resting. If you go running in the morning, that's not resting metabolism. That's a specific um, metabolic increase in requirement. And the combination of your resting metabolism, caloric requirement, and all the other efforts that you make during the day which for some people is intense concentration. Um, those two kinds of caloric requirements add up to your daily caloric requirement. The basic strategy proposed by uh, federal guidelines is to reduce energy intake by 300 to 500 calories per day. That is the essence of it. And so if someone is uh, currently obese at 2,000 calories per day of caloric intake, the idea would be to reduce the 2,000 calories per day to 1,500 or a little bit above that. The next point is, what about diets? Well, a fair amount of research has gone into that subject and ha they've compared uh, different diets, one with the other. And the overall conclusion is that it doesn't matter which diet you decide to adopt, what matters is whether you adhere to it or not. And then another key point is keeping track of caloric intake because it's very easy if you don't do that uh, to in, uh, ingest more calories than you, you want to. Major diets. Here are uh, four that have been compared clinic in clinical research projects. The Atkins diet, which is low carb. The Ornish diet, which is fat restricted. Uh, fat has uh, per uh, uh, 
for weight uh, equivalent more calories than the other forms of dietary intake, carbohydrates, for example. Weight Watchers is both portion and calorie restricted, and the zone diet involves low glycemic foods. Low glycemic meaning foods that um, rapidly, a high glycemic food is one that converts rapidly to calories. A low glycemic food is one that converts slowly uh, to uh, glucose, basically. And the one-year weight loss uh, that was observed in the case of all four of these diets uh, was 4.6 to 7.3 pounds, irrespective of which diet was followed. And that comes back to the point that it's adherence that really matters. Uh, two FDA-approved weight loss drugs. Uh, these are approved for long-term usage. The first one is silbutramine, uh, brand name Ridia. In, but this has to be in combination with a reduced calorie diet, uh, and it's for people 16 years of age or older. The second is Orlistat, and its brand names include Zenical and Ali. And in a minute, we'll talk a little more about these two approved drugs. Silbutramine is an appetite suppressant. It blocks serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake. Uh, those are two key neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, and it has, silbutramine also has antidepressant actions because the two neurotransmitters just listed uh, are involved in, in depression as well. Common dosage is 10 to 15 milligrams per day, and uh, the results uh, have been found to be 10 to 15 pounds over a 12-month period. But I'd like to repeat that this has got to be in combination with caloric restriction and exercise. Early responders to the uh, usage of silbutramine do the best, uh, and one uh, measurement of early response is a loss of four pounds over the first four weeks. Uh, some of the side effects, w which are not um, uh, inevitable but are present, are headache, dry mouth, constipation, insomnia, and nervousness. Orlistat. This is quite different as regards mechanism of action. It does not suppress appetite. What it does is it re inhibits or reduces absorption of fat, dietary fat. It, in, in particular, it inhibits the gastric and pancreatic uh, lipases or enzymes that break down triglycerides. And the fat absorption is reduced by 30%, which is quite significant, uh, in particular because fat has a very high content, caloric content. It also reduces LDL cholesterol. L, I remember as lousy, and H for helpful. It increases HDL, which is helpful. Uh, uh, HDL is the helpful DL. And it reduces blood glucose and lowers blood pressure. Other weight loss meds um, include some appetite suppressants, which we frequently use in, uh, in psychiatric uh, practice. Uh, Wellbutrin, uh, uh, is, which is a well-known uh, atypical antidepressant. Prozac, which is an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and Topamax, those three uh, are appetite suppressants. And then in addition, there are uh, non-prescription meds, uh, basically sugar substitutes, because it's the glucose content of, of uh, sugar-containing foods that, that cause much of the problem. Leptin signaling. Um, this, one of the basic issues in uh, obesity is what exactly is going on that causes people who are obese to eat so much in terms of caloric intake. Um, and th it is clear that in order to be substantially obese, it, you have to be in ingesting uh, more uh, calories per day than your metabolism requires. In 1994, 
a, an exceptional scientist working at Rockefeller University, Dr. Jeffrey Friedman, uh, discovered a new uh, hormone. And this hormone is called leptin, which means uh, thin in Greek. Um, and it, it is produced, the hormone is produced by uh, adipose cells. That's a fancy way of saying by fat cells. And each of the adipose or fat cells in our bodies, whether we're thin or not thin, produces leptin. The leptin goes to our brain, in particular to our hypothalamus, and it signals to the brain that there's enough fat here in this cell. I don't need any more calories. No more glucose is required, so uh, cool it. Don't eat any more. And w originally, when this was first discovered, uh, everyone in, uh, in this country who was slightly overweight went into a state of mild euphoria because the original thought was, fine, we'll just increase the amount of leptin and people will no longer want to eat so much. That was the initial impression. And then a fair amount of clinical research was done and it was discovered that uh, one of the problems with people who are overweight or obese is that their leptin signaling system isn't working. Basically, it's not that their adipose cells aren't producing leptin. Overweight people produce more leptin than uh, thin people. Rather, they have become, for reasons not at all clear, they have become leptin insensitive. And it's the insensitivity that produces the absence of restraint on caloric intake. Uh, as a con okay, the rest is just references. <laughs>